the Cerebral Entertainment Podcast. Hey, everybody. Welcome to yet another riveting edition of the Cerebral Entertainment Podcast. I am James, and with me, as always, is my good friend Colt. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs> with your uh, with your Zevia, mm-hmm. still drinking the Zevia. You like it that much, huh? It's I'm good a, stuff. I'm a fan. Yeah, I'm a fan. I mean, it, like I said before, it's not. It's still soda y, but not as soda y as most sodas. <laughs> that would make sense. Okay, I would hope so. Okay, so yeah, that's good, and it's better for you. We sure. we often try to cut out the evil culprit known as sugar, and the artificial. Colorings and yes. flavorings and all that stuff. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. And you've gotten away from the rock stars, the big energy drinks. Well, I've gotten away from mainly caffeine. Yeah. Here and there. I'll, I'll pre- do pre workout here and there. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I don't know. I just, I get to where I need it. Yeah. And then it just isn't doing anything for me. Yeah. So, you know. Yeah. Which I think we've discussed this before, but it is just for the sake of caffeine, like Austin Stout said, he's exactly correct. It's supposed to, you're supposed to feel it. It's supposed to do something, mm-hmm. right? So if you drink a, a rock star that's 300 milligrams worth of caffeine, you should be bouncing off the walls, mm-hmm. you know? And so if you're not like me, you've grown a tolerance to it. And it kind of gets me back to a certain level still. It's not like I don't feel anything. Mm-hmm. But it's I'm not feeling 300 milligrams worth of caffeine, right? You know, so mm-hmm. was that the main reason why you cut it back? Was just because of that, or you just have some kind of other intuition that hey, this is probably just not a good thing? No, not health wise or anything. It was just dependence thing. And then they also tell you that you should take off, like, you know, every once in a while, take off a couple of weeks or something from it. Yeah. Which I did that, and I tried to have another rock star or something like that. And it still didn't do very much for me. Okay. Um, so I don't know what that means. <laughs> I don't know if maybe I, it, caffeine just doesn't do what I want it to do for me. So there's not really a reason to do it. And then most of the ways that I would get caffeine probably isn't the most healthy, cho- you know, the ho- most healthy thing to be doing anyways. Plus I just want to be able to live life without having to have it. Yeah. That that's the, that's a big thing. That's that's an important thing too just in general mm-hmm. not needing to depend on anything. Right. Really. Mm-hmm. You know, that's very uh very stoic of you. Very stoic. Okay. Stoicism is a fascinating fascinating philosophy. I don't even know what it is, really. Yeah, and I I don't I don't want to talk about it too much because I'm going to butcher it right now. I'm I'm totally not prepared, but I do like the the stoic way of thinking because it is basically in a nutshell, not getting too happy about anything, but also not getting too sad about anything. It's staying so it's in like that keeping medium a baseline kind of. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so, um, not, not wanting to depend on anything, you know, because life is temporary and always having that present knowledge that it, it's, it's just temporary. It, everything will pass. And, like some of the stoic exercises, mental ex- they, they did a lot of like mental exercises in order to keep themselves from anxiety or from getting even too happy about something because happiness is fleeting, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. You get really excited about something. Oh, this is awesome. Well, guess what? Tomorrow, you know, it, it might suck. Mm-hmm. Er- everything might suck. And so it's, it's this constant up and down is the way that life treats us. It's gotcha. the way that life, you know, guides us through this chaos. I think I... I think I'm very stoic than just in general because yeah. I, I purposely don't let myself get too happy or like get too yeah. excited about things like like uh, vacations and stuff like that. It's like because from that first day, I'm like, if I get too excited about this, it's going to go fa- It's going to go by even faster. But I also know that I'm off for a week, but it's going to feel like I'm going back to work tomorrow. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it's like the less I can be like really excited about it, the little it's going to be a little better Mm -hmm. but then again you're not really living in the moment with that scenario either so it's just like trying to find a common ground between the two i think that is very very naturally stoic of you i've all naturally just kind of done the same thing Mm -hmm. 
because I, I hate disappointment. And that's kind of one of the, I think one of the attributes of stoicism is mitigating disappointment as well as anxiety. One of the exercises they would do is think about all the ways that they could die. Like, you know, we're talking about back in, you know, Marcus Aurelius times, you know, Roman emperor Marcus Aurelius. Um, he might think, well, you know, I could be sitting here and, and this roof could cave over on top of me. And you would imagine dying instantly or being trapped in there and suffocating or bleeding out very slowly, something like that. Mm -hmm. And the whole point of that exercise is to relieve the anxiety of death, to relieve the anxiety of that impending doom or torture that might take place. Because even for disappointment, you're like, maybe we, you took a day off work, but then um, you, you're like, well, I'm probably going to get called in anyway. They're probably going to call me and say, hey, we need you to come in today because we're short-staffed. Mm -hmm. And so you would imagine that already happening. And then when you get that phone call, you're like, eh, I figured it was going to happen anyway. Gotcha. You know? Okay. So it just mitigates all of the the ups and downs that life throws at us. And you just stay on an even keel. Gotcha. Now, granted, I think you should maybe only do that with, you know, in moderation. Because life is about ups and downs. I do want to be excited and happy sometimes. I don't want life to just, just always be like, eh. Right. You know, because that's not fun. Right. And I don't think that's the way that we're necessarily supposed to be, if there is a supposed to be. But I do think that stoicism definitely has its place. I, I think that it helps for me to mitigate a lot of anxiety. It always has. Does it ever, like, worry you when something, like, you don't get excited about something, like, that you think you maybe should? I don't really have an example on that, but, like, but I'm just saying, like, if something happens or you're going somewhere that you know you're going to have a lot of fun or do this or that, but you don't, like, you know, you know, it's something really fun is going to happen, but yeah. you're not that excited about it. Cause it's almost like you've got that baseline set for yourself. So you just don't get that real excited for it. Right. But then it like kind of worries you a little bit. Cause you're like, man, I should be a lot more excited or happy because this is going to happen. Well, let me ask you what worry or concern would you have specifically based on that concern? Just that it's not normal. <laughs> 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 well, I gave up on being normal a okay. long, long time ago. Okay. Well, I guess normal is relative to, yeah. I tell you what, one thing, because I have thought about that in certain instances, is I feel like I should be more excited about something or it should have been a lot more fun or something like that. Mm -hmm. I kind of attribute it sometimes to, man, I hope I'm not getting old, <laughs> you know, <laughs> Not necessarily chronologically yeah. old, yeah. but just like old in my mind where I'm just one of those get off my lawn, you youngsters yeah. type of old, you yeah. know, that things aren't just as fun as what they used to be. Like uh -huh. the excitement in life is gone. I don't, I'm not looking forward to that. I don't think it has to go anywhere, but no, I think it's, you know, I don't think it's that though, but that was one of the concerns that I had, not so much that I wasn't normal or that right. there was something wrong with my brain. Uh, it just in general, I think it was, I, I don't know, maybe, maybe it is a kind of a, a an after effect or a, or a side effect of practicing that natural stoicism that, that I have, or maybe I, don't, I just wasn't into it that day, or maybe I was distracted or something. I don't know, but yeah. I, I'm not too worried about it. Okay. I'm not too worried Makes about it. Makes me feel it. a little better then. Good. Good. <laughs> well, because you had asked me, you know, I had gotten this tattoo this past week. First tattoo ever. 43 years old. Good time. Great time. I loved it. It, it was awesome. Went by myself, um, worked with a great artist named Colin McLean over at uh, Artisan in um, Farmington uh, mm -hmm. at the factory. Great artist. Good dude. Uh, very mellow dude. It was He was just very responsive and very professional. It, it was a good time. Leading up to that, though, you know, I, there, I really didn't have a whole lot of anxiety about it. You know, I had already... The most anxiety I had and I have always had about getting a tattoo is deciding on what to get. Mm -hmm. That's why I've never gotten one. It had nothing to do with anything else other yeah. than wanting to find that thing that I wanted to put on my body. Right. I just, I, I'm surprised I hadn't gotten a tattoo in my, in my roaring twenties, which was, you know, a crazy time for me. Yeah. Up into my thirties, I, I calmed down a little bit because kids started coming around this and that. So my priorities shifted. Um, but I could never decide that was the biggest anxiety I had. Everything else really, because I kind of like what you were alluding to earlier, I was thinking, shouldn't, shouldn't I be a little more anxious about this or shouldn't I be 
even I was excited. Don't get me wrong. Mm-hmm. Um, like I said, the process, it, it was a great time. It, it's already, it hasn't even been a week yet. And it's already thinking about it has kind of a nostalgia to it. Right. You know, mm-hmm. it's going to be one of those memories where it's like, man, that was awesome. Getting right. my first tattoo, mm-hmm. the experience, the atmosphere, the artist, you know, my own feelings about it, my, my anticipation. It was great. But I didn't, I wasn't nervous. Like I wasn't nervous about the, any kind of pain or, which I mitigated. I talked to you about how my mind already had, had diffused mm-hmm. the idea that this was going to hurt really bad. Yeah. Um, I've been through just for the, the audience to know, I've told you before, I've been through dental work that it was grueling. It was absolutely grueling. Mm-hmm. It, it, it was over the process of, of an hour or maybe more during those times. Pain and discomfort, like I, I wouldn't want anybody to go through, you know. Um, and so I really, the, anticipating the tattoo, I really didn't expect it to be, I, I didn't expect that much pain, mm-hmm. you know. So it wasn't that. Um, I had already come to terms with what I wanted to get for my first tattoo. Even though I went back and forth still a couple times leading up to it, I was like, man, do I really want to start off with this? Um, but I, and I was excited, but I really didn't have, I, I had a very stoic approach to the whole thing. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. and I think it served me well. I think it did. I, I also think it helped me to kind of ease into the idea of stamping down for sure what I wanted to have on my body. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I was pretty nervous the first time I went in there. I don't remember how old I was when I first got my got my first tattoo, but I got on my arm. Um, and, I mean, the nerves probably went away not too long after they had started. But there's something, there's a feeling you get when you hear that tattoo gun turn on. And it's, that I don't know, it's not necessarily anxiety, but it's a little bit of an anxiety feeling. I don't know. Mm-hmm. And now I still attribute that sound to, uh, to like an electric toothbrush or something like that. There's something that makes a sound that's pretty much the same. Yeah. It's like, Oh man, there's a, there's a little bit of a flutter in my stomach when I heard, you know, when I heard that turn on, you know, it's weird. Yeah. How was the, the second time you got a tattoo? Same kind of feelings, same kind of anticipation of that. The, se- the second one, I had more anxiety because it was a lot bigger tattoo and mm. it was going to be on my back. Got you. Um, and I wasn't really, I mean, I knew what a tattoo felt like, but I wasn't sure of what it was going to feel like on my back. Yeah. And I knew it was going to be going over my spine and stuff like that. So I didn't really know. It was more of the fear of the unknown, you know, than it was like fear of pain or anything like that. Sure. But, I mean, I, I made it through. I, I did a lot of cussing. There was that. Sweet. But, you know. That's always a good time. Uh-huh. What, you know, I meant to ask you this before, but this is a perfect time, I feel like. What, what influences you the most to get the tattoo and what to get, what art to put on your body? Why, why, why did you decide to get a tattoo in the first place and how did you, or or why did you decide to get what you got? So, um, hmm. I've got three tattoos. Two of them were personal, uh, more like, so like my arm is a, it's a cross. I just like crosses. I Mm -hmm. think they're cool. I do too. Um, my arm is a cross that's got a horseshoe through it. So the horseshoe is for Colt. Um, it's got my last name on the horseshoe. And then I've also got my niece and nephew's initials, Mm. um, on my arm. So that was a personal one. Yeah. My back, um, was influenced through music. The, um, it's pretty much a song lyric from shinedown. Uh, but it's, it's a big cross. And then it says, uh, it's got a banner around it that says shall not live under shadow of mistakes. So when I got that, it was just like, not necessarily a dark time in my life, but a time where I could like reflect back and be like, you know, there was, I've done some stupid shit uh-huh. and, uh, I need to be able to push forward and not, you know, just let that kind of, that kind of stuff go and learn from it. So that, that's where that kind of personal thing came from too. Nice. So yeah, I just, I'm not somebody that can just go and just get a random tattoo of something and not mean anything. It just, I just got it cause it looked cool. Yeah. I, I've got to have a, some kind of a personal tie to it in some way yeah so which i think that m- most people feel that way right uh, uh, most at least i mean some people i guess get random stuff or i mean i, I get maybe uh, they want a pretty flower just because they want to decorate their body you yeah know, something like that yeah but, um most people i know there's some kind of meaning attribute attributed to it but i understand what you're saying to me it, it has to be something deeper too right i don't just want to decorate my body yeah 
you know, I, mm-hmm. I because I see a lot of tattoos where it's it's this wicked design, like a lot of tribal stuff and things like that, which I think looks really cool. Mm-hmm. But to me, unless you have some kind of um, background, tribal background, mm-hmm. you know, then to me that is really it, that's just me. I, I could be wrong. You know, they may have meaning attributed to it, and I just don't know. But for me, if I were to get something tribal, it would strictly be decorative. Mm-hmm. And I'm just not there for that. I want some deeper level right. meaning to everything that I get. Right. Yeah. So while we're talking about it, let, give, I mean, you don't have to show your tattoo, but like give it unless you want to. I will. So that's the work done by Mr. Colin McLean. Which it looks awesome, by the way. Yeah. But I, uh, I was really, I, it exceeded my expectations. Yeah. So give, give us the reasoning behind it like what i mean if you can't tell it's an hourglass with a skull at the bottom Mm -hmm. so to you what does that mean yeah and there is sand at the top too so like like your typical hourglass there's Mm -hmm. sand coming down and of course it represents time you know leading into death Mm -hmm. basically and so for me it's a reminder it's it's a constant reminder that time is temporary Mm -hmm. you know in in essence time is short you know, and I think that we always need to remember that to some degree. I don't want to walk around all the time just thinking about death. That's not the point. Mm-hmm. But the point is to not waste my time here. Right. You know, whether it's especially with my kids that they, they've really been on my mind a lot lately. Just making sure that I, I don't want to look back and think I wish I would have spent more time with them. Mm-hmm. You know, which I probably will anyway, regardless. But I've heard a lot of people say that, and I saw a saying not too long ago that you, you're never going to look back and felt like you spent too much time with your kids. Right. So them first and foremost, but just wasting time in general. You know, I, I don't want to waste a bunch of time here on this planet while I'm here because it, it goes by so quickly, Yeah. you know. It seems like forever ago that when I think about when I was like 20, 21 years old, it's like, man, that was forever ago. But really, I look back and I'm like... It seems like it was just yesterday right. at the same time. It's so strange. Um, so it, it's a reminder for me. And it also just is a reflection of like where my mind is at mm-hmm. that um, time, you know, it leads into death. It, we're all going in the same direction. Yeah. And so for me, it was just, it was just a, I, just that it was a representation of, of time and, and where we're going. And I want to be reminded of that. Yeah. And a lot of the, the, I already have several, ideas for my next <laughs> tattoos. Of course you do, yeah. And so they're all going to be, some of, a lot of them at least, if not all of them, are going to be reminders of the same thing. Yeah. But I, I just want it to represent, you know, me and, and my innards. Right. I want to represent my, 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 my mind and my <laughs> spirit and all that good stuff. So yeah, but okay. totally good time. I, I, I'm very happy with it. Like I said, the tattoo exceeded my expectations and I can't wait for my next one. Yeah. And so, yeah. Yeah, I've been I've been thinking about the whole a lot lately too. I don't I don't know exactly when it started, but the main thing like it surprises me that I didn't think about how short life is like a lot longer ago. Yeah. Like I wish that when I was a teenager I was kind of thinking about that. Not not enough toward like give me anxiety, but enough to to think that okay, I'm only, you know, 15 years old. But and, and, you know, 60 years old seems like it's so freaking far away, but it's really not. And I wish I would have known that then. Yeah. You know, it just, I, I, I just think I would have made better, not that I've made bad decisions, but, you know, made better decisions along my way and maybe done things differently. Yeah, sure. You know, not that I would really trade anything that I've got or that I've done, but, you know, there's always that in the back of your head where like, well, you could have done this differently. You could have got this result. You could have done this if you were thinking about how short life is and things like that. It's just, yeah. You're exactly right. And that is a product of getting older and having uh, retrospect and, sure. and uh, introspect as well. But we're not built to be like that as teenagers. Yeah. Even, even in our early 20s. You know, there's a lot of things that t- take place as you start to get older. One of those things is, is becoming more introspective, mm-hmm. you know, and just because when we're, when we're young, we're built to just go, go, go. Mm-hmm. We, we don't have the experience, which doesn't offer the mindset for you to think when you're 18, man, life is short. I need to really, you know, do this and this and this. Right. Not that some people don't, 
But for the most part, that's just not the way that we're supposed to be. Mm -hmm. You know, as you get older, your risk aversion goes down because I, I did some very stupid things mm -hmm. in, in my time, uh, teenage years up through uh, definitely up to my thirties. And if I could take some things back, I definitely would and, and do them over again. But my risk aversion was, was very, very low back then. <laughs> I did some very stupid things. Now my risk aversion is higher, and, and part of the reason why it's higher is because I started having kids, and the kids start to give you that, that mindset. It's like, man, now it's not just me. I've got this, this little human mm -hmm. that I also need to take care of, mm -hmm. and I want to be there for this human. You know, I want to be around for this human. It's, it's not just, you know, which is still selfish of me, um, but it's, you know, because I had family. I had a mother and father and sisters and other people who cared for me. Right. They would have really been sad if something would have happened to me. But, you know, in my mindset as a youngster, as that, you know, that go, go, go type of personality, I just thought it was just me and it would be okay if something happened because, I you know, you live fast, die young, whatever. Yeah, true. But after the kids, things change. And so things are starting to, they're, well, they're going to change for you. I'm sure they are already are starting to change for you. Yeah. In anticipation and, and thinking about what it's going to be like when little dude comes around. Right. That was, that was strange. I'm not sure what that was. Oh, holy cow. Um, the, my phone's doing some weird stuff over there. Okay. For some reason, it's, it's going over to the computer. I thought we were on... Well, we're connected to the computer through. I understand, but I thought we were on Do Not Disturb. That's not working very well. But well, but that's a computer thing. Oh, that that's not a phone oh, thing. Oh, yeah. got you. Yeah, 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 yeah. Anyway. Okay. Um, I'm sure some of those changes in your mindset are already taking place. So yeah. speaking of little dude, where are we at? What kind, of, uh, what kind of things are you anticipating? What kind of concerns do you have, if any? Or just what? how, how are you preparing to be a first-time father? It's still doesn't necessarily feel real yet like I don't, I don't think it's gonna feel real until he's here when you hold him it's when it really yeah. mm -hmm. and like the most anxious thing i am is just to see what he looks like you know you see a little you, you know you have ultrasounds and stuff and you kind of you see him wiggling around and stuff like that but you don't like really know what his face is gonna you know really look like and stuff like that that's what i'm most excited about well just to give you a little heads up most brand new babies, newborn, look, look like aliens. Uh -huh, they yeah. got a cone head. Uh, yeah, dude, they're very alien like. <laughs> <laughs> so that's exciting to hear. To hear, but uh, yeah, I'm. I don't really know where my mind should be, to be honest with you. So I'm just kind of taking it as I can. Yeah. Um. You know, we've got like almost got the nursery done now, so that's making things feel a lot more real. Mm-hmm. Um, but still not really. Yeah. Cause it's, it's like, okay, there's a crib in a room. So, so what until there's a baby like actually laying in it, right? That's not, it's not really going to feel real to me. I don't think. Yeah. And I don't think there's a, there's a should be mindset for you. I think you yeah. are where you're supposed to be. Yeah. I remember the same thing. It's like anticipating the child coming. I was excited and I, I already somehow you, you love the baby before it's even here. Mm -hmm. it, it's strange, but when the baby actually gets there, it's like, it's a wave of emotion because it happened. And that dream, like right in front of your eyes, even though the scene can be somewhat nightmarish. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding, ladies. Um, no, even even the, the time when, when, like Jeremiah, for instance, when he was being delivered... Man, I, I just it was so intense. Mm -hmm. I don't think I've ever experienced quite the intensity of that because just the the emotion of of him, this dream that I had for nine months that I was going to have this this boy, mm -hmm. actually materialized in front of me in, in in a you know a miracle type of way. It's just crazy how it works. Yeah, you know, there's this thing growing inside of of my wife, and it comes out, and I get to hold it, and he gets to keep me up late at nights and I got to feed him <laughs> and change him. But no, it, it's, it's an amazing experience, but you're right. It, it's exactly, it's not real until you actually like get to hold that thing. Yeah. That it real, it kicked in a little harder the other day because I was like a week behind on where I thought we were. So I thought that we just hit the 25 week mark. Um, and I asked my wife yesterday, I said, so this next Thursday coming up, we hit 26 re weeks, right? 
she's like, no, we just did that. We're getting ready to hit 27. And then all of a sudden I was like, oh shit, we're in like third trimesters here right. next week. Yeah. Like that's, that that's the first time that it's hit. But it's weird. Like everything went really fast through the first trimester. Second trimester, not so much. Like it's been, I'm just like waiting for each Thursday to count an, an extra week. Like just try, like just come on, let's do this already. Uh -huh. And then I think that third trimester is going to fly. Yeah. I think maybe not. But it, but it's one of those things too, where it's like you kind of want to, you want it to go by fast because you want to see him, but you kind of don't because you just want to hang on to the feeling of yeah. knowing that he's there and he's going to be here. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. The anxiousness, I guess, but it's a good anxious. It is. Yeah. It is. It, it's also a time of nostalgia that you look back on and yeah. remember when you were anticipating the little dude getting here mm -hmm. and how exciting that was and how surreal it was and mm -hmm. yeah. So it. That, that's the thing, man. I, I Hanging on to moments. I think it's a song, isn't it? Probably. Uh, something like that. Uh, but but hanging on to those moments, those those time periods, even those time frames, it's just, it's so important. Mm -hmm. it, it really is to look back, whether it's a, a tattoo or, or having a new baby, you know, it's just the anticipation of that and then the experience of it. Those things just sear into our minds like... I don't know. I just love it. I love nostalgia. Yeah. I, I love those things. I even look back now and remember some of the, the times I had that during the time it was bad. Like I wasn't in a good a good place or, you know, it was during a breakup or during a, a, just some period of, of just chicanery going on, whatever. And I still somehow, some way look back on some of those, not all of them, some of those. And I look back with nostalgia, you know, I look back and, and, think man i was i was a younger person back then i experienced emotion i experienced things i didn't realize that were inside of me and, and thoughts that surfaced that that were just uh, in some way beneficial okay. rewarding in the long run and it's still nostalgic to me but um and, and with kids as they grow up you're going to have some of those those same instances because it's not all fun and games i don't know if you've heard that or not i haven't raising a child really yeah it's, you, it's, you're gonna bring me down right now <laughs> It's it's always worth it though. It's yeah. totally worth it. You know, I my my thing is like the only real anxieties I have is like I don't think I don't have like anxiety that I'm going to be a bad dad or anything like that. Mm -hmm. I, I I know for a fact that I'm going to put all my effort into into the kid and everything's going to be fine. But it's just one of those things where you never know how a kid is going to turn out no matter what you do. Yeah. I mean, of course you're a massive influence. You're probably the number one influence on the kid on how he's going to turn out, how he's going to think, how he's going to act and those kinds of things. But there's still like that little part inside of me where he's like, what happens if kid grows up to be a serial killer or something? <laughs> you know, True. Like, I mean, and then there's nothing I can do about it. <laughs> I mean, at least he would be famous. That's true, but <laughs> I, but you know you know what I'm saying though. It's like you yeah. you never know, you know you never know if if he's gonna have some kind of issues where he tries to kill me in the middle of the night or something like that. You know, right. it's just one of those things you never know. Yeah, no, I I, I hear you. I would I would just. You know, disagree with one point. I think genetics is the biggest factor, which your genetics True. and your wife's genetics are, you know, are the genetics he's going to mm -hmm. have. True. Um, but those are the biggest factors. Children, when they're born, they, they're a person. Mm -hmm. They're still in a lot of ways, a blank slate, but they have this innate personality that's, that's already there. Yeah. And your parenting, you are the, <clears throat> you and your wife are going to be the, the biggest external factors to the child. Right. So I agree with that, but th there's already something that's brewing inside that child of the way they're going to be. Mm -hmm. and, and as parents, we just have to try and mold that the best we can. Yeah. And it's fun, but it's also challenging at times. Mm -hmm. Like you can't, you can't call every shot that, that for that child. It's like, you can be the best parent that you can be, which you should be anyway, but you're going to do everything that you can to mold this child a certain way. Mm -hmm. And he's still going to turn out the way that he's meant to turn out, the way that he wants to turn out. Yeah. But the external factors are still so important. You know, when bad parents, you know, when, when they have that child and, and all kinds of things go wrong, I see it all the time in my in my field of work. Mm -hmm. You know, the parenting um, for a lot of these, these now grown-ups, when they were children, they went through so much negative and so so many traumatic experiences mm -hmm. and it was a, a lot of it at least not all of it but a lot of it was based on their parenting on, on the parents they had or the lack of parents they had right and so being a parent is man it's it's probably the most important position in this life for, for the sure. most yeah. 
of, of all things that you could be. Yeah. I think parenting is just, it's the most critical thing because you're, you're raising this kid who's going to be an adult one day. Right. You know, your influence on that child is going to have ramifications, not just on that child, but to the, the influence, the sphere of influence that child has on other people later. Right. right. You know, when, when he starts to branch out and he has his own sphere of influence. And so it's this constant and, and we can relate back to our parents and how they did that for us. Mm-hmm. And so it's this, you know, replicating thing. You're not just replicating genes. You're replicating these ripples in, throughout the world. Right. And it gets really deep when you think about that. There's a lot of, a lot of consequences that come about that. Yeah. And then I'm sure like, you see decisions that they make and stuff like that, whether they be good or bad. And then both of those are going to make you wonder like, well, is that my fault? Did I, did I not show him the right way or did I not, you know, do this, that or the other to, you know, or if they do a good thing, like, was that me? Did I, did I help him make that decision like that? Or, you know what I mean? But I mean, because you have to find like the the common ground on like teaching them how to think for themselves, but also, you got to instill stuff into them also. So mm-hmm. it's like, you got to pound some stuff into their head, but also oh, in a way where they think about things on their own too, not just do things because you said yes or no. Absolutely. Yeah. That's right. That's right. So influencing the child to positively influence other people, I think is very important. Yeah. But at the same time, like you said, you've got to let them go and see that they've got to navigate life for themselves. Yeah. And these kids any kids, they, like I said, they're, they're little humans. They're little people. Mm -hmm. It's strange to look at them sometimes, Yeah. especially when they're really little and they do something that reminds you that they are in fact a person. Uh It's like, wow, Yeah. that was, that was weird. It was like this moment in time where you just become mindful of your place in the universe. And you see this little human being who does something that just knocks you off your feet. Yeah. That, 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 and I'm sure probably the number one thing I'm going to remember is the first time that he does something that was like that, that was me. I'm Mm -hmm. I'm sure I'm going to remember that for the rest of my life. Yeah. Cause it's probably going to be like, man, I'm a dipshit. (laughs) (laughs) It's crazy though how it works because my boy, he's nine now and he has no idea how I was when I was nine, Mm -hmm. right? None. But yet some of the things he does, it's like, oh man, (laughs) it's like that, that has to be a genetic predisposition that I passed off to him. Yeah. Like for instance, he'll, he'll sit back in the cut and watch his sisters, you know, older sister, she's 12. She's more the verbalizing, you know, loud mouth, if you will, um, sweet girl, but she's, she verbalizes her opinions (laughs) and whatnot. Yeah. Um, she's my buddy. Um, but he, he sits back and watches her because she's more direct, she's more in your face, more rebellious for the most part, right? And that comes with the birth order too. Um, I experienced the same thing as because I had an older sister. But I see my son sit back in the cut and just watch. And then he waits. If he wants to do something, he waits till we're out of the room. Then he's a little more sneaky about things mm-hmm. and, and less direct, less uh, confrontational. Okay. He, he gets the job done, whatever he wants, whether it's sneaking in to get a fudge round from the kitchen when he's not supposed to have one yet or play with something he's not supposed to be playing with, whatever. Yeah. He doesn't just like train wreck in. He waits and, and does things a little more methodically. Gotcha. That's exactly how I was when I was a kid. Yeah. And, and he has no idea about that, but I can look at him and be like, wow, that's, <laughs> that's, it's neat to watch, although it's not necessarily a great trait. <laughs> but here's the thing, though. This is where it gets tricky. I also know how he is. So I can think like my son. Mm-hmm. And so I can set him up because I'll go out of the room and then I'll wait. Mm-hmm. Because I know, at least most of the time, what he's up to. Then I'll catch him in the act and yeah. we'll talk about it. Right. Right. Oh. And, but that also brings more consequences and the ripples just keep going. It's crazy. Life just keeps happening. But see, he's learning from me too. So he knows that I'm watching him mm-hmm. and he knows I'm going to come up and we're going to have that talk. So he's going to find other ways right. to try to be sneaky. Right. And so it just keeps going. Uh-huh. And it's like, you know, it's like a game. Yeah. You've got to figure out the kid's game. Right. It's crazy. Yeah. So, I, I'm, I'm just picturing that battle happening. Like him trying to, he, he's like, okay, well, he knows I'm probably going to try to do this and so I'm going to try to do that. But then you're thinking about, well, he knows that I know that he's going to do this. So yeah. he's going to try to do this instead. And it, it just a, keeps on going and uh-huh. going and going. It, it gets deep. Uh-huh. And right now he's still nine. So it's not, you know, the, the consequences aren't very 
stark. They're not very intense. But it's, at some point, he's going to outwit you, is what you're saying? Well, <laughs> I, I'm just afraid that he's going to start being sneaky about things that might be more detrimental to I him, see. to his health, something like that. I but see. Is he going to outwit me? <sighs> You had to wake up awfully early in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> Since we basically, you know, in a lot of ways share the same brain yeah. as far as, you know, the logic and the approach to things. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, I wanted to ask you, do you feel like to some degree, are you going to be, do you feel like you're going to be uh, like a helicopter parent? Do you feel like you're going to be pretty overprotective of your child? Have you thought about that yet? About how closely you're going to monitor, observe, and keep them close to you, keep him close to you? I don't know. Um, I've thought about it, but not like in depth, really. Because my, my, like my mom growing up, she was a helicopter parent without really being a helicopter parent. Right. That's what I kind of want to be, I think. Mm -hmm. like, I don't want to be like, you know, make them feel like I have to monitor every step, every word they say, every step they take, that kind of thing. But I, I also want to make sure that they know that I'm still there. You know what I mean? Um, so can, so, can you, I, can you unpack that a little bit? What's a helicopter parent without really being a helicopter parent? Is it like stealth helicopter? Like one of those military helicopters that's over your head, but you can't hear them. I guess like not overbearing, like not an overbearing parent, but can be overbearing at times if they feel like they need to be, I guess, yeah. which maybe that maybe that isn't the definition of a helicopter parent. I guess, but like growing up, I, I was able to, you know, go out and do my own thing, but I also kind of felt like I had an eye on me when I was out and doing my own thing too. And mm. maybe that's just how I was raised, you know, maybe that's just, and whether they were doing that on purpose or not, I don't know. It's just, you know, they were working their way through life with a kid too, just trying to figure out what, what you're supposed to do, you know? Yeah. So I don't know. I, I'm not real sure. Do you think you're a helicopter parent? I think I am a stealth helicopter okay. parent. Okay. I don't helicopter like like for instance, just an example. You know, we we live in a great neighborhood, and by all intents and purposes. I have no reason to think otherwise. Mm -hmm. You know, not that you know whatever. Always knock on wood type of situation, but we live in a great neighborhood where we you know we feel great about, especially my daughter just walking around the neighborhood with her friends. They go they play in the the street there. Cars know that there's kids in the street, and so they're safe. Well, you know, so on and so forth. But um, when she's like say walking to a friend's house, and especially if it's getting dark. I don't walk with her, but I will oftentimes go to the window or to the back and watch her till she gets to the door mm -hmm. safely. Mm -hmm. So that's a little stealthier. I want to yeah. know that she's okay, right? right? I yeah. don't. I don't want to. The, the thing I don't like the thought of is if something were to happen and I didn't know about it right away, then there's this time elapsed. Right. That time elapsed is what concerns me yeah. because that's the time where I could have been doing something. Yeah. Right. Right. And that's, I don't know what I'm going to do when she starts driving because I'm not, you know, I'm not going to follow her around. I might by that point in time, maybe get a high powered drone <laughs> with a high definition camera. <laughs> there you go. No, I'm not going to do that. So it, it's going to be a challenging time for me, you know, but I, I, I try not to be overbearing, but I do that all the time. Like I will watch, like if my boy, or, or Kayla, my girl, is trying to cut something, like a tomato or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, if I see that they're cutting it, I won't say anything, but I'll watch mm -hmm. to make sure they're doing it okay. Right. If I see something that's not right, then I go correct it. Mm -hmm. If they're doing something that where they might cut themselves or so on and so forth. So I don't want to be a helicopter parent, not for the sake of the stigma of being a helicopter parent, but kids have to learn. You have to slowly but surely kick them out of the nest yeah you know and right. so it's a process and also I, I i need to know that i can count on them to make good decisions at the same time when i'm doing that i'm obs i'm observing them to see where they're probably going to make some bad decisions too yeah you know you kind of project that based off of their personality and their current behavior mm -hmm. and you try to correct that not all in one swoop you correct it you know, just uh, organically with them by, right. by teaching them, giving them principles and standards. And the other night, it was the other day when we were coming over to your house for your birthday party. Mm -hmm. um, Kayla and I were talking about something, and I, I guess I don't realize I do it like I do, but I, I try to make a lot of things educational points. And, and she called me out on it. She's like, Dad, you're always 
you know, <laughs> you're always having these talks with me about, you know, A, B, and C. I said, yeah, but, you know, my dad did the same thing to me. And, you know, what I found, he was he was right. Mm -hmm. You know why? Because he had experience, right. just like your daddy does. Mm -hmm. And those moments, though, are important because I think she she got what I was saying. Yeah. You know, she mm -hmm. got that I'm not saying this because I'm trying to be Mr. Know-it-all dad who's always trying to tell her what to do. Right. I want her to learn from that. And so I try to organically instill a lot of these principles and, and just – life lessons so that it helps her, yeah. you know? Yeah. Well, I mean, th things are just different now too, like mm -hmm. society wise and stuff like that. Like you're, you're lucky that you live in a neighborhood where, you know, you, she can go out and play and stuff like that. But also you can keep, you can keep that eye on there. You know, back when you were a kid and, uh, and I was a kid, there was a lot of like, Hey, uh, you need to go outside and I don't want to see you until dinner time. Right. That kind of thing. You know, there was no helicopter parenting there. It was, I don't want to see your face. <laughs> you, you need to, you need to go outside and play basketball. You need to go down the street and, you know, go to the park or whatever, go ride bikes with your friends or something like that, you know, Yeah. which I never had my, mine wasn't necessarily ever that it was just, I wanted to be outside and I wanted to be, you know, and I lived on, I didn't really. Like I lived on land where I could be outside all day long and not have to, you know, really mm -hmm. go inside a lot and stuff like that. I wasn't a whole lot of going out of town with my friends and riding bikes and stuff like that. But, um, so my parents could keep a little bit of an eye on me, but I don't really think they did much, yeah. you know? So it wasn't that strict around here, mm -hmm. but yeah, I think about that too, man, because when I was, man, I want to say seven, eight years old, at least by eight I lived in uh, a, a neighborhood, so to speak. It wasn't like in town, mm -hmm. but there were houses er everywhere on this county road. And I was seven, eight years old, I was riding my bike, you know, two, three miles away to go see my cousin or go see my other friends or something like that. Yeah. And yeah, I had to tell mom and, and usually mom where I was going, but... I was just gone. Mm -hmm. There's no way I would let my kids do that. Not right. not at seven or eight. Right. Now, my girl's 12, so she's getting older, giving her a little more and more freedom, responsibility to work with, because mm -hmm. you have to. Mm -hmm. You know, even though I might have a desire to some degree to keep her just still really close and not let her get too far away from me, mm -hmm. that's not going to benefit her later in life. You know, because she has to you know, experience a progression right. uh, of instances that that back to back so that you learn and, and so that, you know, you know what to do and how to be safe, how to be careful. Um, you've got to start that somewhere. And, and she's at that point. I don't think it's really an age so much, but it's more of a level of a maturity, I mm -hmm. guess. Yeah. But there's no way I was letting my kids do that. And I already knew that. Yeah. And I don't know what to think about that. Is it is it really do you feel like it's like that is really indicative of society or like, is it really that much more dangerous now? Do you think, or, or are we just perceiving that because of maybe the 24 hour news cycle? And yeah, because I say maybe media makes things look, you know, wor maybe worse than they are. And it might just depend on where you are. Yeah. Stuff like that. But I think influences come into play too, from like your kids, friends and stuff like that too. Like, have you had, have you gone through that to where you, you know, your kids might have a friend that you're just like, uh, I'm not real big on them, so you don't. So you keep your kid on a tighter leash whenever they're around that friend. Somewhat. 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 Not. Not like I, I can't think of any of her friends that I was actually like. You're not hanging out with that person, right? Um, there are some of her friends that I watch a little more closely. I watch because, especially at the age of twelve, I know you know, 13, 14, 15, it's just around the corner. Mm -hmm. And so those kids, even though they're not necessarily doing anything overtly that I'm concerned with at this point, mm -hmm. I can kind of project where this may be going. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to watch those kids a little more closely versus some of her other friends where I could see that they have more of a, I would say just an innocent mindset in general. They're not quite so uh, uh, adventurous, and so that, that adventurous like nature or that trait isn't necessarily a bad thing, but I know what it can lead to. Right. You know, yeah. it's a pretty wicked stuff. And mm -hmm. so I, I, yeah, but you, you do kind of assess the, the kids, uh, friends, personalities yeah. to see what some of the threats, the dangers might be, if not for now in the future. Right. That I, makes sense. I remember my mom and dad doing that with me. Really? It's like, yeah. When I was around certain friends, especially well, both of them, 
Well, my dad did the same thing. My mom was always around more to call me out, though. Like when I was around one of my certain friends, she was always asking me questions. She was already on it. I mean, I mean, she and she could pretty much figure it out because she <laughs> could read me so well. And I didn't realize how well she could read me back then. I figured it out later. I was like, man, she was good. Like she <laughs> she knew everything about me basically. Yeah. But if I was out with that friend, she would want to know, you know, she would ask questions and, and it would lead up to, well, she caught me smoking one time. She never did actually catch me in the act, but she knew what was happening because she was already alert because of this particular friend. Mm-hmm. You know, different things like that, that kind of leads the parent to a certain line of questioning where they can dig out the truth. Right. It's a fun experience, man, but it's stressful. Yeah. It is stressful. But my kids, I put some gray hairs somewhere i have this one gray hair in my nose i mean it's <laughs> it was my first gray hair ever and it was in it was a nose hair yeah it was the thickest grayest hair i've ever seen in my life and i still don't have much i've got some in, on my chin yeah but uh, yeah that nose hair that that, that was for my kids <laughs> for sure <laughs> You should just show them that all the time. She's like, you see, yeah. look up there. You that's, see that, that thing? That's you. <laughs> what, the booger? No, the, the hair, the nose hair. The booger is just a natural process that happens from the build of mucus inside of me anyway. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we don't need that. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I, I'm excited for, for a little dude to get here, too. I can't wait. Yeah, it's going to be like my biggest thing right now is just the fact that one of my number one things that I hate is not getting sleep. And I have that to look forward to. <laughs> yeah, is not getting sleep, but I don't know. Hope maybe he'll come out and he'll be one of the good babies that just like sleeps throughout the night and all that. Hopefully, but I doubt it. Hopefully, and a lot of things where like I make the joke that you know, like if I, if like me and my wife are talking up talking about how he's going to be or something like that, and I'm probably and I make the joke like, yeah, with our luck, he's going to be like this. You know, and I make that joke, but then again, I'm like, that's probably going to be real on most things. Uh Like he's going to do the opposite or he's going to be hard headed. You know why? Because we're both really hard headed. Right. Me and my wife both. Yeah. And that's going to be, that's going to be one of the cool things for me too, though. It's a little neat little noise. Is it going to do it again? It did a second time a while ago. There There it is. is. Follow through. It's what we call that. That's right. Um. Oh, it's just like seeing the combination of both of us in him. And like how he, how he assesses situations, uh, like with a, my mindset or the wife's mindset, mm-hmm. you know, and just hoping, <laughs> just hoping for the best. That's all you can really do. <laughs> yeah. Leading back to what you were saying earlier about, did I do that or, or did mm-hmm. I do that mm-hmm. for me? I, it, when it's something good, I know I did it. And if it's something that's not so good, I, I of course that was his mom. <laughs> that's, how, that's how you do that yeah, yeah for sure that's how uh-huh. you navigate that whole logic uh-huh it is it is interesting to see though how how they formulate how they develop mm-hmm. a, as people and being able to see the traits of both you and your wife right in that in that little human that ends up developing in their own way because they are definitely not a complete replication of any one thing yeah you know they're when you put because personality and intellect and all the all the things that make up a human being, it's so complex that you can't put two complex things together and expect it to be simple. Yeah, and I, I think that's something that I really learned as as the kids develop is that I figured it would be a little easier as far as being able to determine how how the person is going to end up, mm-hmm. the child mm-hmm. as a person. It's really not that easy, man. There are so many factors, both yeah. internally and externally. And at the end of the day, too, you know, I, th- I think the parent is the biggest factor of influence, but there are so many other factors as well. Mm-hmm. You got school, you got friends, right. you've got other family members, you've got the internet, mm-hmm. you've got, you know, television, you all these different factors, music. Oh my gosh. There's so many of these different factors that play into the development of this person. Right. That there's to simplify it is just it's not even a thing you mm-hmm. can't yeah you know, but you, you start out with a, a, a basic human being a little ball of flesh that comes from two people you put together, it cries a lot it craps a lot you got to feed it so it can crap some more mm-hmm. and if you don't it'll cry some more uh-huh. and it, it does the whole milk thing and mm-hmm. um, it's a great time though yeah it's I mean, a great that, time you basically I think just described the first year probably <laughs> yeah. so that. That's going to be fun. Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> Can't wait for that. Yeah. But then you get to see first steps. 
True. And then when that happens, you start putting all the uh, guards on the electrical outlets. Right. And you have to start keeping your podcast door locked, mm -hmm. your room in here, your studio. Is it got a lock on there? Yeah. Yeah. There's, you're gonna you're gonna be using there. that. Yeah. Because once they start walking, then it's a whole new ball game. Yeah. It's weird. Like we were, me and my wife were talking the other day, um, because we got a um, one of the mon baby monitors. It's got a camera you can you know put in the bedroom to overlook the crib while you know while you're in another mm -hmm. room or whatever. Yeah. And uh. She was talking about putting a shelf up on the wall over the crib, so uh, to put the set to set that on, and uh, you know I made the comment I was like, well, you know you got to make sure that the shelf's at least high enough to where when he is, you know when he does get a little bigger and he is tall enough to stand in there that he can't pull the shelf down or whatever. I was just thinking, that's weird that I'm already thinking about that, like that he could be big enough to stand up in a crib. I'm like, he's not even here yet. <laughs> like, he's not even just laying in there yet. He's, you know, it was just, it was a weird thought that I'm thinking, like thinking that far ahead about certain things. That's only the beginning. Yeah. Those considerations are huge mm -hmm. because I, I didn't like, I think we had a, a shelf over Kayla's crib and I hated it because I just always thought about it falling down while she was laying there mm -hmm. and, and hitting her in the head. Yeah. I, it drove me nuts to where I, I couldn't take it anymore. I had to move it. Yeah. You know, so all those considerations that you had that you never would have it just opens your minds up your mind up to a different universe right. of considerations mm -hmm. of possibilities yeah and a lot of it i mean it's called worry yeah. and concern but it's also just a lot of projection a lot of uh, uh planning you know mm -hmm. where do i put this shelf or, or where do i need door locks or you know you got to get those things where they can't open the cabinets you got to have the buttons that you push and, and get you know child proof Right. cabinet opener thingies yeah all that all that kind of stuff the electrical outlet covers uh you name it man car seats uh, i have a question have you ever actually seen a baby get their finger in a socket the the problem is they st sticking things in it yes from, okay. from a very young age okay they learn how to like those plastic things where you have the different shapes and uh -huh. you take the shape and you got to match it to the shape uh -huh. from, from a very early age they start sticking Ooh. things into gotcha. other things okay, okay. so a and fork into the something like that an fun. ink pen okay. but yeah i i've i think my little sister actually when she was a baby not a fork or anything it didn't electrocute her but she was trying to get something i think it was an ink pen maybe okay. she was trying to stick it in that hole if there's something that looks like something goes in it gotcha. a child is going to try to fill uh, that fill that void <laughs> have you have you seen the facebook meme where it says uh like it's a picture of that block the block thing you're talking about and it says why it's important that kids play with this. And then the bottom picture is like trying to fit a mattress in the back seat of a Honda I or did. something. <laughs> I, I did, which was never going to happen. <laughs> no. Yeah, I did see that. It's just funny. That child uh, should have had one of those toys. Uh -huh, for yeah. sure. <laughs> All right, man. Well, I'm excited for a little man to get here. Yeah. yeah. I'm sure he will come up in conversation more in the future. And then one of these days he's going to be able to get on the podcast and listen and be like, hey, they were talking about me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He probably won't like it. <laughs> <laughs> ah, he'll be okay. Hope so. My kids too. If they ever want to listen, they, you know, I'm sure they'll look back and remember that dad thought about them enough to include them in conversation. So yeah. Did does do they know that you talk about them on this show every once in a while? Jeremiah could care less. Yeah. He, he doesn't care about such things. Kayla, she does. She does. She's, she's asked me before. Oh, has she? Yeah. What? what she she's asked me i don't remember if i brought it up first like i was talking about something and alluded to me talking about her and she was like hey wait you talk about me in the on the podcast but i she's asked me on other occasions at least hey you know were you talking about me on the podcast or have you talked about me and yeah okay i was so, just curious i didn't know uh -huh. if, i didn't know what her feelings were on that like i could see it either like making her excited or the other side, like, don't talk about me on there. What are you saying about me? Yeah. That kind of thing. That second one hasn't come up yet, but I wouldn't be surprised because yeah. we're getting ready to turn 13 pretty soon. <laughs> and it's, man. Every time you say the number 12, it's just like there's a an aura around that when you say it. Uh-huh. It's hard. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard. <laughs> Especially for the girl, man. I mean, and I'm call it sexist. I, I don't care what you say. You know, really. But... A 12-year-old girl is different than a 12-year-old boy for me. And it, that it's partially the way that I was raised, but there's just different considerations, man. Yeah. It's just, it's a different ball game when you have a, a girl coming up, for me at least. Yeah. It, it's, it's tough. But you know, like I said, she's my buddy. I, I kind of anticipate, because I've heard time and time again, that at least for a while, you 
daddy, you're going to lose your little girl for a while, you know, mm-hmm. as far as that daddy girl connection, mm-hmm. you know, I, my goal is to hang on to that as much as possible in, you know, in whatever way that I can, mm-hmm. whatever way is appropriate. Like, right. I know she still has to develop. She still has to learn. She has to psh, get boyfriends, whatever. We won't uh, get into that yet, <laughs> but I know that's coming. I know that that's going to happen, but I still, I'm, I'm instead of being so rigid in trying to keep that daddy daughter relationship um, and, and trying to keep it the way that I want it to be, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. I, I'm trying to be flexible and, as Bruce Lee said, be like water. Right. You know. Yeah. Uh, I'm I'm trying to be, I'm trying to adapt mm-hmm. to to meet the needs of her, but also the you know the, to try to foster that connection for as long as possible and as much as possible. And yeah. so I'm hoping that it, it never truly goes anywhere. Right. But having said that, I've always also always heard that even though dad is that connection, you lose that connection for a while it almost always comes back. Yeah. You know, down the road when they get older and they, they realize, Hey, that's, you know, yeah, dad's a pretty cool dude. Let me ask you this. This might be an odd question, but does, has having a kid made you want to consume more knowledge on things or how to do things or anything like that? Because you think you're going to want, okay. What do I mean by that is like, say you don't know how to fish, Mm -hmm. but, does it make you want to learn how to fish just so you can teach your kid how to fish? Yes. I've been thinking about things like that a Mm -hmm. lot. Like me growing up, I had a great childhood, but my dad worked swing shifts for most of my life. Yeah. He didn't make it to very many basketball games and all that kind of stuff. He was always working. It's just one of those things. So Mm -hmm. the majority of things that I learned growing up came from like doing stuff with friends where they had to teach me how to do it right? or something like that. And there's a lot of things that I still look back on now where I'm like, I never really learned how to do that growing up. So I kind of just stayed away from doing it because it just, I either, I didn't really have a desire to learn it or I just didn't want to put, make a burden on somebody else to teach me how to do something that I felt I should know how to do because like my dad should have taught me how to do that or something like that. Mm -hmm. So now I'm just thinking about those kinds of things and I'm like, well, if I don't know how to do something now, I need to put in a little more effort and learn how to do it just in case my kid comes to me and says, you know, Hey, can you show me how to do this? I don't want to be sitting there. Like, I don't know how to, I don't know how to do that. Now there is YouTube (laughs) now, so that's going to be a plus. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, but I also want to, I I just want to learn things. I want to know how to do things that I don't know how to do already Mm -hmm. so I can pass that stuff down. Absolutely. I don't want to, I don't want my kid to come to me and say, Hey, can you teach me how to do this? And me just say, I don't know how to do that. And that be the end of the conversation. And they don't learn something that they wanted to learn because I didn't know how to do it. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. My, I, I know exactly what you mean. My dad taught me quite a few things when I was a, a, a pretty young kid. Um, as I got older, he got busier. Mm-hmm. Um, he still taught me a lot, but mostly in the way of the, the mental aspects of life. He taught me how to be a critical thinker. You know, he taught me how to be skeptical of, of most things. Um, taught me how, you know, about influence once again. He taught me a lot of those mental aspects. When I was a lot younger, though, he taught me how to fish. You know, he taught me how to hunt to some degree. He wasn't. He didn't really care for hunting. He didn't like killing other animals, which I don't necessarily enjoy it either. I just I want to I want the benefit of being able to feed myself and my family, mm-hmm. you know, if crap hits the fan, or if I just want to go off the grid a little bit more and, yeah. and be more self sustaining. Um, but but fishing, hunting, um, being able to do you know fix minor things. My my dad didn't do that much either. He didn't you know he wasn't a handyman around the house so much. He did teach me how to cut grass with straight lines and how to weed eat things like that, which is also I think pretty important. Um, those things, I think, are, are some of the fundamental things that especially a father should pass on to their boy, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah. Um, and, like, for some people, it's also working on cars. A lot of people talk about working on cars with their dad. Mm-hmm. My dad definitely wasn't a mechanic. Right. Never had the desire to be. I don't either. So yeah. that's that's one thing I'm not <laughs> passing on. But it would still be a good trait if I were a mechanic. That is definitely something I would want to pass off to my son. Yeah. But uh, otherwise, I, I think the staples, once again, are like fishing, hunting, you know, uh, cutting grass, uh, well, like stacking it, wood, cutting wood, yeah. using a chainsaw, things like that I think are important. Yeah. I mean, have you ever had that, like, not necessarily a mechanic, but, you know, people who always change their own oil in their vehicle. They don't take it to a place, you mm-hmm. know, and, I, and I've, I've been in that scenario before where I asked somebody or I, I said something about me taking my truck to get the oil changed and they look at me like, 
Yeah. Do you don't change your own oil in your truck. And I'm like, no, I take <laughs> it down there and like, but I don't, I don't know how to change my own oil. That's, that's the thing. Yeah. Maybe that doesn't make me a man, but I didn't, I mean, guess what my dad did growing up? He took his truck to the place to get the oil right. changed. He didn't change it on his own either, you know? So it's just kind of like, I'm accepting things now that I was hard for me to accept earlier on. Like, like I'm accepting things that I don't know how to do or the knowledge that I don't have because I just didn't have that growing up. And there was like a little bit of an anger side of that at first. Yeah. Like, well, maybe I should have learned. I Somebody should have taught me those things growing up. Yeah. But then again, I'm thinking it's not like he didn't want to. It's he was at fucking work. Mm -hmm. He like, couldn't. He couldn't. You know, he didn't have the time to do those kinds of things. And then any time that he probably did, I was probably out playing with friends and stuff like that anyways. I wasn't even home. So, right. You know, so there's just a mixture of things that caused it to be that way. Yeah. You know, so. That's good. Of, it's good that you let go of yeah, that, that yeah. anger. Yeah. I mean, I, I wouldn't necessarily say anger. It's just a... You know, you just look at it like, well, maybe I should have known those things, mm -hmm. but you just have to look at the whole picture and find out why, mm -hmm. you know? And if I really wanted to learn, I probably could have learned if I really wanted to. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've learned how to change my own oil. I never changed my own oil, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And, and people say, well, yeah, it only costs, you know, blah, blah, blah to change your own oil. But yeah, I pay for the convenience of someone else doing it, getting it done. <laughs> right. You yeah. know, mm -hmm. that's, I, I'm willing to do that for that. Mm -hmm. it, there, there are other things like... I'm in the process of still scraping the old paint off my shed so I can repaint it. Mm -hmm. That's something I could hire somebody else for mm -hmm. and I wouldn't have to worry about it, but that's something that I, I don't mind doing myself. I can do it myself. And I mm -hmm. think the, especially the difference in price, because if I actually hired somebody to do it, it's going to, they're going to charge me quite a bit. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, it's okay for me to do that myself. Yeah. You know, I'm okay with that. Little things like that. Yeah. Which little things that's, it's kind of a, Big job. I mean, that's a big thing, but you know, you, you know, the little things around the house that even if you have YouTube and they show you how to do it, it's still like a little win for you whenever you actually do it and fix it. Like I had absolutely, uh, my toilet was hissing the other day and I got on YouTube and just typed in hissing in the back of my toilet and it told me what pieces to take off and what to clean out and put it back together and the hissing's gone. Score. I'm just like, thinking, heck yeah, I'm going to yeah. show my kid how to fix the toilet <laughs> <laughs> because YouTube's going to tell us how to do it. Leave that part out. Yeah. Just say, this is how you fix a toilet, kid. Yeah. But right I mean, the, the I mean, I think it's those things that are like the fishing and the hunting and the stuff like that. That's, mm -hmm. the, that's the real important things. Yeah. Agreed. You know, because, uh, you know, as we said, YouTube's a thing. So like, there's probably gonna be a lot of times where the kid's going to be like, not even come to me because he can just type in YouTube on his phone. Like, you know, when he gets older and just find out how to do it on his own, he don't, he's not going to have to come to me, but you know, the, like the fishing and the hunting and that kind of stuff early on, that's yeah. what, that's what's important. I yeah. think that's important for a couple of different reasons. A, there's the connection there, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. because there's a lot of minutia that YouTube can't tell you. Yeah. Like you might get on there and somebody can show you how to bait a hook or something, you know, yeah. or how to, how to tie on your lure, but it can't show you like necessarily when you get stuck in this particular, you know, root wad or, mm -hmm. or you get a hook full of moss or whatever, or this and that, how to do it without, you know, poking your finger or, you know, waiting out to, to get the, the lure out of the root wad, whatever. There's the connection. There's also just the, it's, it's the, uh, the time that you spend and, and just the little things that you're going to be able to, to, to do while you're, it, it's time that you, that you have with that little person mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. And, it, and it's getting them in nature. Yeah. You know, because the more they gravitate toward technology, which you can't go out in nature and learn how to fix a toilet that's right. hissing at you. Uh, but you can go out in nature and, and fish and hunt mm -hmm. and do all those things. Uh, play basketball. Teach your kid how to shoot hoops. Right. That's a good time. Mm -hmm. I, you know, my dad taught me how to play sports, especially baseball. Mm -hmm. He grew up playing baseball. And he taught me how to throw a ball and how to catch, you know, how to field grounders, how to, you know, swing a bat, mm -hmm. keep your eye on the ball, all that stuff. It's it's so important to have that that connection with your with your youngster to, and to pass those things along because mm -hmm. you never know what they're going to do with it. Yeah. It's awesome. Yeah. I'm excited. Yeah. Yeah. All right, man. Well, it's been an hour and something. I can't quite see. Oh, yeah. <laughs> now I can. You can get that big counter now at the bottom, that hour and three minutes. Oh, I just seen that. I didn't know that was there either. I just cool. I just saw it. I think it was coming with the last update that we updated. Gotcha. Okay. So, yeah. Um, good times. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, we'll see you all soon. Yes, we will. Have a good one.
What's that mean? I don't know. I think it didn't stop recording. It's not working. Oh, it is right there. Uh, I hit start streaming on accident. Yeah.